Now, how did the molecules of life arise? And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Howdy. I heard you like videos. If you're not already watching on YouTube, you should toddle on over to YouTube and you should subscribe to Postmortem Video, all one word, and you should click subscribe, and you should click the little bell, and you should select all when you click the little bell, and whatever other hoops that YouTube now has you jump through in order to actually be subscribed. Basically, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hello lovelies. Uh, this is gonna be a weird one. Um, today we're going to be talking about the cipher system, which I may or may not have looked at before in a previous edition of the main book. I have Numenera, I have a couple of other cipher system books, and I have a previous edition of the cipher system rulebook. And it's a fairly chunky book. It's pretty big. But I don't know exactly how much I'm going to have to say about it because a lot of this chunkiness is things that you can't really go into huge depth about. So, yeah, um, let's review the Cypher System rulebook. Like a lot of people, I think, during the whole open gaming license kerfuffle, uh, a lot of other game companies with open systems that were not uh, under the OGL uh, began quite aggressively advertising, hey, come over, use, use our system to develop your games. Um, we have our own license, or we're going to have our own license. And the Cypher system was very much one of those. I have previously examined using the Cypher system for games that I might create, but their licensing is quite a bit more restrictive. They have a lot of the vaguely worded sort of morality clause type stuff that was such a problem uh, with the attempted update to the OGL. I did write to them. And I said, look, I might be interested in, in developing some stuff for Cypher, which is you know, obviously in your interest because it might drive more people to buy uh, the core rulebook. But I'm concerned about these morality clauses and um, that if I do create something, you're going to force me to take it down or whatever. But I, I was reassured uh, by them that this would not be the case. Um, that they've had plenty of edgy and horror and so on type stuff created for Cypher um, and that they've never had a problem. Uh, to which I guess I can say, lol, challenge accepted. <laughs> the person clearly didn't know who they were talking to. Um, so yeah, I'm still uneasy about developing anything for Cypher, at least anything that is explicit or horrific. I think people's concept, people's conceit of what is edgy has been blunted very much from where it was uh, to the point where I'm not sure how much I can get away with <laughs> these days, whatever my motivation and, and whatever else. People are actively looking for reasons to get upset. So that makes me still uneasy to develop anything for Cypher. It's a bit of an odd system, is the Cypher system. It's really quite unconventional. It's one of the first games I was aware of where the player does all the rolling. So as a games master, you don't really need to do much of anything except track what happens. You don't need to roll for the baddies, you don't need to do any of the maths and so on. You can just leave that down to the down to the players. And that's fair enough. Um, anything that takes the load off the games master is good. 
But it does mean, I think, that you are going to be bombarded with uh, begging for for bonuses uh, from your players when it comes to rolls. Not dissimilar to any other system, but given it's the main way to interact with the Cypher system, I think it's going to be a bit more difficult. Okay, so the basis of the system is pretty simple. You have a difficulty level, normally from 1 to 10. The actual difficulty is three times the level. So at level 10, the difficulty is 30. Right, and that is the score that your players are trying to get on a d20. Now, the mathematically astute of you will have noticed that you can't roll a 30 on a d20. And there is no automatic a 20 is a is a success in this. If it is a success, it's a it's a good one. Uh, same with a 19, and a one is still something bad happens, but not necessarily catastrophic to your character. So what you have to try and do is that you have to try and ease the difficulty. So let's start with something with a slightly more manageable difficulty of seven, which is tagged as formidable. Okay, and that's difficulty 21. And normally, you can't make that on a D20, right? So you might expend effort, and low-level characters can only expend so much effort. Uh, effort comes out of a pool of points, so you knock a number of points off that, typically three for the first one, and that would drop the difficulty level to six. 3 times 6 is 18. Now you only need an 18, 19, or 20. So 15% chance to succeed. Okay, but maybe it's a task like picking a lock and you have a really top top shelf set of lock picks. Well, that might reduce the difficulty by another one. So that might take us to difficulty 5. So now you need 15 or more. Uh, and maybe you can take your time that might drop it another one to four. So now you only need a 12 or more, and, and so on. You, you get the idea. Um, skills provide what's called easing, I think. Uh, tools provide easing. Certain special abilities might provide easing. Um, but you're limited in how much effort you can put into a task. You're limited by a kind of loose level system called tier. Um, the maximum amount of easing you can apply to anything is six levels, so yeah, that that that's an issue as well. Sometimes you might get free levels of ease which don't count towards the six, um, and 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 so on. So that's how you mechanically interface with the difficulty, and certain enemies might have a particular level uh, at the most simple. So, you know, beating up a goblin might be a standard task. Beating up a hobgoblin might be a demanding task. Beating up an orc might be a difficult task, and, and so on. There are complications, but it is fairly intuitive to throw things out there with certain difficulty levels and then to interact with those. So it's all pretty simple to keep track of. Now, characters can be described using sentences. So you might be a, a charming rogue who swings from chandeliers, for example. Yeah, not an accurate example, but like that. That's quite nice in the way that it can encapsulate your characters. But statistically, they're defined by three different areas. Uh, might, which is your strength, power, constitution, speed, which is your dexterity, reflexes, how fast you can move, and your intellect, which is your intelligence, willpower, cunning, those sorts of things. Each of those comes with a pool. It may or may not have an edge, and you also have effort, which determines how many times you can spend from your pool. Edge can reduce the amount of cost. So normally, to make things easier on the on the table, you would have three points 
to reduce it by one, another two points to reduce it by another one, another two points to reduce it by another one. Edge can reduce the cost of reduction for effort. Um, and if it rolls over to, to three, I think, um, then you get to apply a free level of easing before doing anything else. So you get a free one and then you can apply effort and take it down. Uh, pull is also part of your health. So when you take damage, it comes out of your pool. Typically, starting with might, uh, then moving on to speed, then moving on to intellect. And each time a pool is reduced to zero, you take a level of wounding. A um, little bit unwieldy, but not too, too unwieldy. What I find difficult about that is that if you're making an effort, you're taking away from your ability to resist damage. Um, and, you know, you can end up straining yourself to the point of being wounded. Not that you have to spend effort, but early on, certainly in the game with beginning level characters, you're going to find yourself having to exert from your pool making an effort rather than just coasting on what skills and so on you have. Um, so that can be a, a, a little bit odd, and it may, tends to make might a god stat in a way. Uh, weapons and so on aren't very granular. They do very set small amounts of damage. You can get bonus effects if you roll a 19 or, or 20. Sometimes that can be expanded. You get minor effects, major effects, and on the flip side, the Games Master gets to introduce complications on a particularly bad roll. So characters are defined by those pools, uh, which are pretty broad. Their tier, which is a very kind of loose sort of level system, it's halfway between uh, a, a freely leveling system where you can pick and choose what you raise as you go along and a level system due to the tiers. And as you unlock the tiers, you unlock more powerful versions of various things and you can up your stats more and so on. Uh, there are types which are broadly analogous to class. You could probably do without those in a certain way uh, if you really wanted to. Um, they're fairly open, but still might be a bit too restrictive for some people. So you've got your basic types, your warrior slash fighter, your adept slash mage slash mystic, um, explorers, which is kind of a rogue-ish, um, speakers, which I can't remember <laughs> what that is. Uh, you also may have more specific ones relating to particular settings. There are flavor capabilities. So there are, within classes or types, there are certain abilities that are unlocked, but there are also ones that are available to everybody that you can choose from. Um, so that allows a bit more customization. You also get to use a word to describe your character. Um, an example here is appealing, so you might be sexy looking or have a particularly good way with people. You know That gives you access to certain capabilities and determined starting skills and so on. So you end up with a very broadly defined character uh, with a bunch of special abilities and permutations. And this would seem to be the curse of simplistic systems uh, coming to the fore once again. You've heard me complain about Tristat in that, yeah, another game that has three statistics. Um, in that it has a very simple basic system uh, with mind, bo a body, and spirit, I think it is in that. Um, and But then it ruins it all by having all kinds of permutations, exceptions, complications and so on special abilities that override that basic simplicity and interact with each other in ways that are hard to really understand how they're going to work <laughs> right so i think cypher has a similar issue though the tier system stops you having too many complications all at once 
So it kind of eases you into it and gives you time to get used to the system before it becomes uh, too too difficult, perhaps. But it is still a problem. At least as the games master, you can kind of push that off onto the players to deal with and to handle. Uh, and you just might have to make a ruling uh, rather than a rule about how things interact and work later on. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff on focus, which tends to be things like uh, more more special abilities. This is where you might access certain supernatural abilities and so on, but also other things. You know, it can unlock particular abilities and, and so on as well. It's all part of that sentence descriptor I was talking about. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Um, and then it gets into uh, after the special abilities slash powers slash everything. It, it gets into genres um, later on. Like I say, th there's a lot here, but not a lot I can really review because it's all permutations of things. Um, and even in a big book, you can't cover everything. But there is enough here for you to base your own powers and capabilities and so on on. Um, we're getting there. <laughs> okay, more about the rules, but we've, we've gone over that. This is just extra permutations and influences and guidance and so on. Um, don't need to immediately reference that, really. Uh, how you spend experience. So yeah, you raise certain things, but in whatever order you want. And then once you've fulfilled all those raises at the lower tier, you then advance to the next tier. And then you can choose to advance things in a, in a different order again. So your edge might get better. So it becomes cheaper to expend effort. Or your pools might get bigger. Or you might have access to another extra ability and so on. Then we get a genre gu guide. Um, so we got fantasy, modern, science fiction, horror, romance. Uh, weird. Um, <laughs> not many people are playing romance. Uh, superheroes, post-apocalyptic, fairy tale, and historical. Yeah, that's that's touched most of them, I guess, because you can put near future and cyberpunk and so on under science fiction, perhaps blended with modern. Um, and you can blend modern and fantasy if you want that kind of urban fantasy feel and so on. Yeah, this is specific permutations and suggestions regarding equipment, weapons, and so on uh, throughout the different genres. So, yeah, it's, it's good to have a basic guide there. They could probably do some more in-depth guides for certain things. Um, you've also got plenty of example monsters, but because it's a generic book, uh, they're either very generic or they're very specific to certain things. Um, but there are various different versions of the of the cipher system. There are various worlds for it. There is fan support, so if you're after something particular, uh, you you can certainly find it without too much trouble and there's enough generic stuff here that you can then customize so that works fine same with npcs ciphers this is the thing that doesn't necessarily fit with all the genres the the idea of ciphers really comes from numenera uh, or numenera where these were random, odd, little technological devices left behind by previous civilizations that could do odd, weird stuff, but were one-shots. Like scrolls in D&D &D or whatever, but, but not scrolls. It's hard to wedge these into some genres. You could, perhaps, in a cyberpunk game, make them drugs or turbocharged batteries for your cybernetics, uh, that kind of thing. In fantasy games, maybe you can go with scrolls or one-shot magic items or enchantments that have been laid upon you that are, are one-shot, like 
maybe there's a contingent spell on you and if you get attacked it will flare up and reduce the damage or whatever but it, it takes a lot more thought and it doesn't necessarily fit uh, as as easily now, this is presented as a generic system uh, some GM advice it's nicely that's mostly specific to the cipher system now this is presented as a generic system but it does produce a rather pulpy way of playing games um, characters are pretty tough so long as you keep the levels reasonable and under control they're probably not gonna get into a, a huge amount of trouble fighting anything um, if we look at the kinds of games that are produced in-house for Cypher System like Numenera uh, like The Strange I think that's what it's called you know they're kind of weird oddball slightly different sort of sort of games you could use it to replicate um, some of the stuff from Gumshoe um, if you wanted to make a more investigative game you could blend the two systems together relatively easily I think um, and it might might actually even, even be a good idea if you want to do a kind of investigative system am I going to use Cypher though? I have a project that I'm doing in collaboration with with other people that could go with Cypher or Gumshoe Cypher might actually be better but I am still gun shy and wary of developing anything for any company <laughs> that has such a bunch of restrictive or hypothetically restrictive morality clauses and, and things so it's 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 difficult to know right because I don't feel safe developing for it with the open gaming license and now the creative commons there are no morality clauses in games that were using those there were if you wanted to use the d20 license back in the old day um, but not not now so while cypher might be a good fit I'm still reluctant especially if I want to introduce horror elements or if I want to introduce elements of sexuality or if I want to make a game that explores politics I think that's one of the the topics you're not supposed to engage with um, because someone will or even if you're doing a critique of a certain political stance uh, or satirizing a political stance someone's gonna think you're advocating for it and so you're gonna run into problems so I don't know I <sighs> There's lots of things to like about the Cypher system. There's problems with the license, but I can't really review a game on that basis um, because most people aren't game designers, game developers. Um, uh, yeah, it's just something to keep in mind if you're someone that wants to make games using Cypher. All right, let's give it some scores and uh, put this puppy to bed. In terms of style, can't really fault it. Um, there's a lot in here, but it's written in a pretty accessible, understandable way. The system's simple and graspable. Um, the artwork is consistently good or very good uh, for the most part. Still has the same problem that so many games do with color printing in that the, the artwork tends to get muddy there's not much that pops about it I, I consistently complain about this and I will continue to complain about this until something changes um, everything's just so low low contrast low vibrance and it's it's weird because just when I'm making thumbnails for videos about books you know just up the vibrance a little bit up the saturation a little bit up the contrast a little bit and suddenly the image is like several times better um, but I can't really fault it on presentation too much so let's give it a um, 4 out of 5 for style uh, considering it's a generic rule book and those tend to be quite dry and text heavy and so on in terms of substance the substance is fine there's a lot of it 
it covers the genres in a basic way, but you know, I'm not going to penalize it too much as a as a generic system and a, and a toolkit system um, for the problems that go along with that, not being able to go in depth enough on the genres and so on. Um, and the issues around that the other permutations of the system and how they all interact with each other uh but yeah still i'm gonna have to give it a, a four out of five for substance as well so that's a pretty high score that's eight out of ten four out of five that's a that's a pretty solid recommendation but i think you have to keep in mind that it is a very pulpy heroic level kind of system that the rules permutations and the way they interact uh, screw over screw over the basic simplicity of, of the system um, so it's a good fit where it's a good fit it's it's not where it's not and it's very hard to make it do things that it's not explicitly designed to do so there are caveats it's very good for certain things um, and if you're okay with a more restrictive license if you're a if you're a super cash normie who never does anything edgy it might be a good choice to develop for it does seem to have a fairly active and engaged community so there's that uh, but there you go maybe i'll do something with it maybe i won't we'll see interesting from a design point of view zang aren't you a little tired of so-called horror media about shiny, sparkly, angsty, whiny monsters. I know I am, and that's why I created Actual Fucking Monsters, where you will play an actual fucking monster, doing horrible and monstrous things and being tracked down and killed for it. By now, at DriveThruRPG, post-mort.com or lulu.com